not intentional, but I just couldn't bring myself to do it last Sunday. We had our men's chili cook-off. It was uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, right before Christmas, when we went out caroling. And uh, it, was, it was close, but Barry Anderson uh, triumphed again. His name is already on here. Like, there's Barry Anderson, then there's Mrs. Barry Anderson for the men's chili cook-off. We found out some things. We found out that he had some help one year. But uh, this year, Barry brought it. Barry, can you come down and take your trophy? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you have any words to say? No, no words. Okay. <laughs> Leah is so excited about having a trophy that she was campaigning for everybody else. Right? She does not want the trophy or mantle. You just have it for a year, and then next year maybe it'll go someplace else. We'll see. Well, we're here to worship the Lord this morning. I'd like to invite you to stand as we worship our Lord together. We're going to start off with just a quick word of prayer. Um, so. Lord, we just thank you today for just the opportunity to come and just to worship you. And um, Lord, we know that there's so many people around the world who just don't have the same opportunity to worship freely. So Lord, we pray today that you'll just um, be with us, Lord. And we, we just thank you for the blessing just to be able to come here and just to worship you. And we thank you for being a God who's worth worshiping. Um, we love you. And in your holy name, amen. God in heaven and heal my honor. So I'll let my words be few. Jesus.
jealous for me It loves like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions Eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are And how great your reflections are for me No, how he loves us so Oh, how he loves us How he loves us so Like a hurricane, I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affection. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just, um, we thank you. We thank you for your presence here this morning. Um, thank you for loving us. Um, we say that a lot. But we just don't know how to, to better put into words the love that you've shown, what, what it means to us. This morning, God, we just want to love you back. Thank you for this opportunity to worship you. That you truly are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray.
Thank you and be seated as we worship the Lord through our giving. do two different renditions of some old hymns. And I really like old hymns um, a lot because their verses and just their lyrics are just super powerful. And um, the first one is Tis So Sweet. And it's a little bit more upbeat, but it's just, this song is super powerful because just the idea of like trusting in Jesus. Um, I just think it's amazing that we have a God that we can trust in. You know, it's like the faith that we have is not a blind faith. You know, we have a God who has come and has walked in our world and who has shown us that he's big enough to handle our problems and um, conquer death. And he lets us be a part of it. And all we have to do is trust him. And how, like, how sweet it is to trust him. That's the name of the song. It's so sweet. And the second one is an old hymn um, called Be Thou My Vision. And the words are a little... Um, archaic, I suppose, but when you listen to them, they just resonate um, so strongly with the heart. Um, and the reason why I like the, this version of the song is because um, there were some guys who came back and they wanted to do like kind of a more modern, like acoustic version of the song. But while they were going through the lyrics, they realized that as beautiful as this song is, nowhere in this song, Be Thou My Vision, um, in the original, is the name Jesus mentioned. Um, and so they went in and they added a chorus, and that chorus says, Oh God, be my everything, be my delight, be Jesus my glory, my soul satisfied. Um, so as we sing these next couple songs, though they're familiar and a little bit different at the same time, I just really pray that like, you know, we'll, just, we'll just take these words and we'll just place them on our heart, and we'll just realize we're singing to the King. Um, and I, I know we usually sit for the second half, but if you would, would you please stand, and if you can't for like, reasons, you know, because you just can't. That's okay, too. But um, I don't know. I just feel like when you stand, you, you sing more. I don't know. Okay. All right. You guys ready? so sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise and to know thus saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I proved him or and oh. Jesus Jesus precious for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, and 
lived in simple faith to plunge beneath the healing cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking joy and rest and joy and peace. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. All right, we're going to do something a little different here, so just follow along. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. 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 I'm so glad I learned to trust you. Precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, will be with me. Me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Oh, for grace to trust him more. Amen. Thou 
dismiss our children for Children's Church. I invite you to be seated. We are beginning a series this morning um, helping friends through tough times. And we're going to be looking over the next four weeks at how to help friends who are struggling with debt, how to help friends who are struggling with discouragement, how to help friends who are facing an end to a marriage, how do we help friends who are experiencing death, dying. We, we just experienced that at our church this past week. Brenda Roy's husband passed away, and uh, um, you know, just an awesome thing as he came to know Christ, and uh, you know, just so excited and, and to see the way God works and, and comforts. But you know what was really cool was to watch in the time before when Boyd was getting really bad, and to see friends show up, and to see friends show up to his house because Boyd couldn't come out and. To see a group go over and a group kind of went over and had a little church service with him because he couldn't have one and he wanted to have another one and never, never got to. 
But as a friend, what do we say to somebody when they're going through something really difficult like that? What, what, do, what do you say to somebody who is facing the end to a marriage, not something that they wanted? You know, it's, it's kind of tough. Uh, but God's word gives us a lot of insight on how to be a friend. I like to look at Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning of verse 9. And it talks about the value of friendship. Ecclesiastes 4, 9. It says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. You know, there's something about a friendship that's, that's that being there whenever your friend needs you. You know, the other thing it says about friends in Proverbs 17, 7, let's just go ahead since we're so close, turn back to Proverbs 17, 17. And here it talks about one of the nature, natures, one of the characteristics of friendship, real friendship. It says, a friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A friend loves at all times. Now, it's interesting to see what the Bible's take on friendship is. Because if you go, turn just a few pages the other direction, and you look at what the Bible has to say about friendship, you can see, let's, let's, in fact, let's go to the last book of the Old Testament in Malachi. And as we're turning there, I just want to share what, what God's word has to say about friendship. He actually says, in, in, as he's talking to Job, he says that even enemies, even somebody who is not close to the Lord, needs friends. And in fact, let me just read that in Job 6.14. We'll, we'll get back to this in just a moment. Job 6.14. Job had faced some really difficult times. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But it says, To him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend. Let me read that again. To him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. Read that again. To him who is afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend, even though he forsakes the the fear of the Almighty. You know, as we talk about friendship and we talk about this, it's kind of interesting as we think about what marriage is and the pain that's caused whenever a marriage ends. Malachi, as we were just turning back to, uh, tells us in 2.16, it basically says that God tells us, he says, I hate divorce. I hate divorce. Why? Because it's breaking a promise that we made to God and the other reason is that God knows the pain that going through a divorce, he knows the pain that that causes. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus is asked about marriage. And he's asked about the subject of divorce. And in the process of explaining in Matthew chapter 19 what marriage is, he says, he says these two people, they should be joined together. Now that word joined together literally means to be glued to one another. And that's what marriage is. And if you've ever glued yourself together, right, men, don't raise your hands, but I can, I can relate to this, right? If you've ever been playing crazy glue, glued yourself together, you know how painful it is to pull that apart. Marriage is two people becoming one. And whenever a marriage ends, it is ripping something that is one now, and it's ripping it apart. Now, this morning, this is not a, a message about divorce. But I just wanted to make sure we understand what God has to say about this and why he so strongly is a proponent of marriage and, and, and working things out. But the reality is this, is that there are times in a marriage where one person wants a divorce and the other person doesn't. And the reality that we know is that and sometimes our friends don't have a choice in this situation. So, so God understands the hurt that's involved with this. And we, we understand it as well. It's interesting. In 1967, there was a study done. Let me just read this real quick. 
It's a psych- psychiatrist Thomas Holmes and Richard Rea conducted a now famous study of 5,000 medical patients to determine the connection between stressful events and illnesses. As a result, they developed a scale of 43 common stressful life events with assigned points from 1 to 100, 100 being the most stressful. They discovered that anyone with over 300 points of stress was at risk of developing a major illness. The number one most stressful thing to face was the death of a spouse. 100 points. The number two most stressful event, 73 points, was a divorce from a spouse. The third most stressful event was separation from a spouse, 65 points. So, So if you look at this, whether by death or by divorce, the end of a marriage is one of the most painful things that a person will experience in their life. So what do we do whenever we show up at a friend's house and they're, and they're going through this? What do we say to that person? It's, it's kind of interesting. We live in a Facebook generation. I am on Facebook. I am a stalker. Right? I'm the guy that's just there. You, know, you, for, you forget that I'm there. You friend request me, and you forget that I'm there. Right? I'm there. You know? I, just, I just kind of like watch and see what's going on in everybody else's lives. I don't really friend request people, but I accept friend requests from just about everybody. You know? uh, the only person I've ever declined a friend request from was a guy who, uh, who friend requested me. He was on my Pee Wee baseball team, and I think he played like left field or something. And he just looked really scary. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I don't know how much information I'm like, this guy, you know. Uh, but I've got the, the first baseman from my Pee Wee baseball team for requesting me. Ron Brown, hey, okay, I'll be your friend, you know. And, and I've got all these people that have friend requested me, and I like that. That's awesome. Now, I don't have like thousands of friend requests. I'm not in danger of the 5,000 friend limit I think that Facebook has, right? I, I don't know how many friends I have. Sue probably knows. How many friends do I have? couple hundred, 300, I don't know, something like that. That's how many friends they have. But there was an interesting article in the New York Times Magazine. Let me read this because I think it's kind of interesting. It says, this past summer, I logged on to Facebook and realized that I was close to having 700 online friends. Not bad, I thought to myself. Absurdly proud of how many online friends, cyber pals, connections, and acquaintances I'd managed to sign up. But the number made me uneasy as well. I actually had fewer friends to hang out with than I'd ever had before. So I decided to have a Facebook party. I used Facebook to create an event and invite my digital chums. Facebook gives the people the option to RSVP in three categories. Attending, maybe attending, and not attending. Of my 700 online friends, 15 said they would attend the party. And 60 said maybe And a few hundred said not, and the rest just ignored my invitation. On the evening of the party, I took a shower, I shaved, I splashed on my tingly man perfume, I put on my new pants and my favorite shirt, brimming with optimism, I headed over to the neighborhood watering hole and waited, and waited, and waited, and eventually, one person showed up. I chatted with my new potential friend, Paula, doing my best to pretend I wasn't dismayed and embarrassed, but I was too self-conscious to be genuine. I kept apologizing for the lack of attendance. I looked over my shoulder every time the door opened and someone new came in. I guess you can have me all to myself, I said, trying to sound beneficent and unworried. We smiled at each other awkwardly. We made small talk, and eventually we ran out of things to say. After she left, I kept waiting for anyone else to show up. It was near 11 p.m. and all my rationalizations were wearing out. The combination of alcohol and solitude turns my thoughts to self-pity. Was I really that big of a loser? Or was it that no one wants to get together in real life anymore? You really have to blame the entire modern world. People want to hang out with you, I assured myself. They just don't have the time. But by now, it was near midnight and was finally starting to seek in. 
No one else was coming. I ordered one more drink. I raised my glass in a solitary toast and promised myself I'd spend less time online. 700 supposed friends, and I was drinking alone. Facebook in a crowd, New York Times Magazine. Friends show up. You know, we, we have this new definition of friends, and I, I do, I think Facebook is, is a wonderful thing. I think it's a great way to reconnect with people. I think it's a great way to stay in touch with people. But really, a Facebook friend is not the same thing as a real friend, as a, as a biblical friend. That when one person falls, it's good to have somebody next to you because they, they can help you get up. A friend who will love you at all times. A friend who, whenever you find out, they find out that there's a problem at your house, that they're going to be there. Friends show up. Even when people turn their back on God, God said they still need a friend in Job 6.14. You know, the first thing that we need in a crisis is we need a support group. We need a group of friends that we can turn to. And that's why, to be honest, that's why I love our church. I, I love the fact that there are a lot of times where after church has been over for an extended period of time, I'll just look at whoever's standing there and say, hey, lock it up when you leave. I'm, I'm gone. <laughs> you know, I love that you stay around and talk to each other. I love that you enjoy getting together for dinners. I, I love the fact that you enjoy when we come in in the mornings, getting with your groups and just talking and, and expanding your groups and spending time together. Because it's important that we develop relationships beyond the casual Facebook friendships that we sometimes just have. You need somebody close in your life who will be there to help you in these difficult times. Now, Job chapter 2. Let's, let's look at Job chapter 2. Job is is going through a difficult time. And we're not going to look at the whole story of Job. But we know that Job was an incredibly godly man. And in fact, Satan comes and to God and says, uh, hey, you know, uh, he comes, he's accusing the brethren before God in Job chapter 1. And God says to Satan, hey, you consider my servant Job. That there's no like him. He's, he's blameless. He, it doesn't mean he's without sin, but that means that that he's living the life that he's supposed to live. And so this, this thing begins to happen where Satan is, is going to say, hey, I'll show you how, how true Job is to you. He just serves you because of the benefits he gets from you. Take away the benefits and, and, and watch and see whether he serves you or not. God says, that's fine. And so Satan begins to work Job over. He takes away his family. He takes away his wealth. He takes away his possessions. He takes away everything that he has. At the end, his wife looks at him and says, curse God and die as even his health is taken away. So Job, in Job chapter 2, where we pick this up, he's sitting in a pile of ashes. He's covered with boils all over his body. There's no place he can sit that is comfortable. And in Job chapter 2, in verse 11, we read something. It says, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuahite, and Zophar, the Namathite, for they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar, and they didn't recognize him. And they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. What happened? When Job has his thing happen in his life, Three guys show up and they're stubborn. You know, the, the best thing that we can do when a friend is going through something as, as tragic as the end of a marriage is to show up. You know, you can, 
you can say, hey, that's great, you know, and James talks about that, that we're, you know, this, this faith thing is we see somebody who has a need, we say, well, God bless you, I'll pray for you, I'm really sorry you're going through that, and then we, we kind of leave. But in James 2, he says, if there's something you could do to help that person, man, that's faith. If they need clothes, buy them some clothes. If they're hungry, don't just say, I'll pray for you, give them some food. If they're hurting, don't just say, hey, I'm sorry you're hurting. Go sit with them if that's what it takes. Because friends show up. That's what friends do. Even at a time like this. Now, it doesn't mean that, that we show up and we, we, we cheer them on. Yeah, that rack them, smack them. And we, we're, we're proponents of marriage. And until the divorce is finalized, there is hope for reconciliation. And there have been a lot of marriages that have been in a place to where they thought there was no return that have, that have turned around and come back. We can't say that we understand. We can't say that, that we, 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 we truly get what they're feeling. If we've not been through that. But we can be there and we can hurt with them. I want you to think about what Jesus did when Lazarus. Lazarus dies. Jesus shows up at the time, basically all this time for the funeral. He gets there, and all the people are weeping and mourning. What does he do? He weeps and he mourns with them. He sympathizes with their feelings. And that's going to be something important later as we, as we get, move on through this a little bit further. So we know that we're going to be able to point them to somebody who understands like Jesus. The first thing that we need to do whenever we have a friend who's going through something like the end of a marriage is we need to show up. We need to show up if they want us there. And it's not what you say. I've had so many people ask me, what do you say? What do you say? I have no idea sometimes. There have been many times where I've gone into situations without the slightest clue what to say. And I'm telling you, it's, it's not a good thing. You know, it's, it's an uncomfortable feeling. You know, this, just a few weeks ago with Boyd, you know, I got a, got a call on Christmas Day that Boyd's not doing very well at all. Can you come over and, and spend some time with him? And so I jumped in my car and I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not ready for this. And I stopped over at Campbell Lakes and pulled in and, and talked to the Lord for a while and, and then went over to, to Boyd's house and, you know, what do you say? It's really cool. You can point them to God's word and they'll do that. But as much as anything, it's not what you say. It's, it's the fact that you care enough to be there. We, we share their pain. If you look at Job 2.12, it says they, they had this appointment to come and be with them when they got there. They saw how much Job was hurting. It says when they raised their eyes from afar, they didn't recognize him. He, he was it's such a mess they didn't recognize him. And they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. And they sat down with him on the ground for seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him. For they saw that his grief was very great. It's not just what you say. A friend shows up. And whenever you show up, it's, it's not that you understand everything that's going through, but you hurt with your friend. You can be there and you can sympathize with your friend. A, a pain shared is, is, is like a, a pain that's cut in half. And whenever you're there and you're with them, that is something that God tells us that we can do. And we, we pray for them. When you don't know what to say, we pray. What, what do we pray? Let's look at Psalm 34, 18. Psalm 3418. I'm going to show up. We want to share, share their pain, sympathize. And we want to support them with prayer because truthfully, sometimes when they're in that place, they're just not ready to do that yet. Psalm 3418. It says, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such 
It has a contrite spirit. One thing that we need to realize is this. Is that when we pray for somebody who is hurting at the end of a marriage... God is already close to that person. He, he, that person is already on God's heart. He tells us time and time again, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart. He's near. He is there in that room. He is waiting for them to open up and to turn to him. And as a friend, the one thing that we can do is to kind of point that person to God. And we're going to have to realize that they may have some things to work through whenever they, they, before they can pray to God. Because they may be mad at God about what's going on. They may not understand. They may blame God for what's going on. But I can tell you this. God is not responsible for any marriage that ends. God is not the person who made the choices, who had the actions or behaviors that brought a marriage to an end. And our job is to point that person in a loving way. And if they're not to that place, then we pray for them. God, help them to realize your presence here in this place. Help them to realize in the midst of all of their pain what you want to do in their life. And then they've got to be ready to accept God's grace. And that's tough. You know, Hebrews 4.16 says that we can boldly approach the throne of God to find grace to help in our time of need. So God is there in that situation. And when you go to talk to a friend who is hurting like that, you can have the confidence of knowing that God is already involved in this situation and you've just got to point them to God and you've just got to point them to that place to where they will be honest and open up with God and share what's on their hearts. Now, for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through and read, but you read the book of Psalms, and you read how many times David tells God that he's mad at him. That sounds like blasphemy, isn't it? But we've said this so many times before, I just want to drive this point home. Does God not already know what you're thinking? Does God not already know that you're angry with him? then why play the games and pretending like and faking that everything is okay? We don't have to do that. That's hypocrisy. And when we come to a friend, we come to a friend and say, hey, look, I know you're hurting right now. God is there. He's, he's here, very near in our time of trouble. And he's, he's there to help you. And if they're angry with God, tell them to talk about it. Because they've got to get that off of their chest. They need to ventilate. They need to get all that, that nasty stuff that's in out. As, as many of you know, you know, I work for a company that, that does repairs, uh, insurance restoration construction company. So um, after a fire, you know, one of the biggest problems with a fire is smoke. You know, most people who, who die from fires don't die from the fire. It's smoke inhalation. And most of the damage is caused by fires you might think would be all the flames and the charred wood. It's not. It's, it's the smoke. And one of the first things that a fire department will do, and we like that in the construction business, is they will take a, a chainsaw or they will take an axe and they will bust out doors and they'll bust out windows and they'll cut holes in the roof to get the smoke out of the house. Right? Because you've got to get all that nasty stuff out before you can begin to, to solve the problem that they have. And it's the same thing in our relationship with God. We've got to encourage them to cry out to God, to release their pain, tell them, this is exactly how I feel. Look, look at Psalm 142. Psalm 142, we'll look, just look at one example here. Psalm 142, this is a prayer of David when he's, when he's hiding in a cave. From Saul. It says, 
I cry out to the Lord with my voice. With my voice to the Lord, I make my supplication. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then you knew my path. And the way in which I walk, they have secretly set a snare for me. Look at my right hand and see, for there is no one who acknowledges me. Refuge has failed me. No one cares for my soul. Nobody cares. I cried out to you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Attend to my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I am. Interesting, isn't it? Why was David so close to God? And why was God so close to David? Because David just poured his heart out. And listen, when somebody is facing something at the end of a marriage, they've got to release that. And it's our job as friends to let them know that it's okay. It's okay to, to tell God that you're hurting. It's okay to tell God that you're, you're angry. It's part of working through that, that process. The next thing we need to do after we, we get them to, to release is we've got to encourage them to forgive. And this is hard. But Ephesians 4.31 God's word tells us something about forgiveness that's, well, it's, it's tough to hear. But man, when we can put it into practice, it's life-changing. There are three destructive emotions that will devastate somebody who's going through a divorce. Bitter, bitterness, anger, anger, and guilt. Bitterness, anger, and guilt. And holding on to any one of those three things can devastate a person's life. Ephesians 4.31 says this, let all bitterness, let all wrath, let all anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Now, let's read this again, and I want you to think about this in the context of somebody who is facing the end of a marriage. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you as well as all malice. What's he saying? He's saying, let it go. Give it to me. Let me carry this for you. He continues on and he says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. That's tough. But you know what? Somebody who's going through something like this, hanging on to that bitterness does not hurt the other party. Hanging on to that anger does not affect the person who's, who's not there. It affects the person who's hurting and needs healing. It's tough to say. But it's imperative that we point them to forgiveness. Is it easy? No. But is it necessary? Yeah, it is. We've got to move on. That person has got to accept that I've got to move on. Let's, let's look at 2 Samuel chapter 12. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, David again is facing something pretty horrible in his life. He's had an affair. He has been caught in it. 
Bathsheba is expecting and has a child. Up to 1 Samuel chapter 12, or 2 Samuel chapter 12, David kind of thinks he's gotten away with it. And then he's confronted by Nathan the prophet. So at the time this is happening, the husband's out of the picture because David's out of court. He's married to Bathsheba. They've got a little one that's just been born, and, you know, that's just pressure, right? And then Nathan the prophet comes and gives him some news. He tells him that because of his transgression, that the baby's going to die. Now look at verse 16. David therefore pleaded with God for the child. And David fasted and went in and lay all night on the ground. So the elders of his house arose and went to him to raise him up from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. Then on the seventh day it came to pass that the child died. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Indeed, while the child was alive, we spoke to him, and he wouldn't heed our voice. How can we tell him that the child is dead? He may do some harm. When David saw that his servants were whispering, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. So David arose from the ground, washed and anointed himself, and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. Then he went into his own house, and when he had requested, they set food before him and, and ate. And his servants were confused by this. And, and they said to him, what is this that you've done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child died, you arose and ate food. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. What was it that David realized? The same thing that we as friends have to make our friends understand. Is that you have to let the past be the past. You cannot change where you've been. You can change where you're going. And one of the reasons why it's so hard is because we keep, there's this tendency for us to keep a what if I had done this or what if that or, or I'm angry and I'm bitter and all. And as long as we hold on and as long as we live in the past and as long as we're there, it's like continually re injuring an open wound. It's going to take time. It took time for it to get to the place where it is. It will take time for it to heal. But it will heal and it can heal. We've got to come to God. We've got to get them to let go and open up and ventilate to God. We've got to make sure that they understand that God's already there. They don't have to go looking for him. He's already there. We have to pray for them if they can't pray for themselves. We have to show up. We have to try to, to strengthen their faith. How do we do that? There's power in God's word. I, I, I know Brenda wouldn't care if I shared this. But whenever I went over to see Boyd on Christmas Day, he was very distraught. And we sat down. And I read Philippians, and we talked about death. You know, it's going to happen to all of us. And whenever a guy's at the end of his life, and he knows it's coming, you can talk all around it, but you may as well talk about it. And so we talked about it very frankly. We talked about what Paul says about death, and we talked about, you know, what, what, you know, what the Bible, how it describes death heaven and what it's like. And then we went to the 23rd Psalm, which if you don't know where to go, that's just a good place to go for just about everything. And we talked about that. We read the psalm, then we went back through and, 
and, and instead of saying, the Lord is my shepherd, we read it together and said, the Lord is Boyd's shepherd. Boyd shall not want. He makes Boyd to lie down in green pastures. He leads Boyd beside the still waters. We want, went on, yea, the Boyd will walk through the valley of shadow that Boyd will fear no evil. Let me tell you something that happened. A, a peace just came over him. Why? Was it because I'm so good with words? You know me. <laughs> That's not it. Right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And regardless of where we point them, if we can point them to God's word, their faith will be strengthened and their faith will grow. When they can't sleep at night, find, find, find a chapter to read. We need to also realize, lastly, that God's not through with that person. Philippians 1.6 says, He who began a good work in you will continue to perform it. He will continue to perform it until that day that Christ returns. Look, It's not easy being a friend sometimes, a real friend, right? What do you say? I always get so confused on Facebook. When somebody posts something bad that happened in their life, do you like it? <laughs> do you, what do you do with that? You throw out the encouraging words. I mean, that's good. That's great, right? But friends are going to show up even though it's not going to be easy. And you may not know what to say. Just you being there is going to say more than your words. We point them to Jesus. We just listen, let them ventilate. We, we love on them. We weep with them. We encourage them that there is life on the other side of this. That's friendship. God is already in the middle of that situation wanting to help. We've just got to point them to the Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for our time together this morning. It's, it's hard sometimes. It's awkward when we go to these situations that are uncomfortable. But God, I just pray that you'd help each of us to realize that really it's, it's, it's not us. It's it's you through us. And as we submit to you, your words will come through us. You'll tell us what to say. You'll, you'll place those verses on our hearts. You'll help us know when to listen and when to talk, when to rebuke and when to encourage. God, help us to be that kind of a friend. Lord, this morning, if there's somebody here who may be going through something like that, I just, just want to lift them up and pray and just that they would just realize that, that you are a very present help in their trouble. We just have to turn to you. And God, for the rest of us, I just pray you'd help us to be, to be friends. In Jesus' name, I'd like to invite you to stand just in attitude of prayer. As the music plays, you may know somebody who's hurting right now. Maybe they're going through something really difficult. Maybe that person's you. It's a wonderful thing to cast all of your cares on him and to know that he cares for you. As the music plays softly here, I just want to invite you to, to come and maybe let go of some things that you've been holding on to. Maybe have that, that, that deep conversation with the Lord, the one you've been putting off because you're afraid of what he might think about what you think. you this morning, I invite you to come and spend some time with them. If you 
you're here this morning and maybe maybe things are going pretty well for you right now, that's great. But you, if you know somebody who's hurting, will you lift up your friend in prayer this morning? You can pray at your seat. There's just something about coming down and praying at the altar. You can do that. But this time is for you. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I just want to tell you that God loves you in a way that may be really difficult for you to understand. I want to challenge you to accept it. Step out by faith and say, I don't understand why, but I believe you do love me. I know all the sins and I know all the things that I've messed up in my life, but thank you for sending your son to, to die for me. If you don't know Christ is your Savior, someone would love to show you this morning how you can be saved. You can experience that help that we're talking about, that amazing presence in your life. This time is for you. God's spoke in your heart and encourage you to act right now. Dear Lord, I'm so thankful that we're not here on this world alone. It was never your plan for us to go through life isolated from others. You want us to have friends. You want us to be friends. I just want to thank you for the friends you've placed in my life. And I just pray, God, that you would just help each of us to be that kind of friend that, that we all need for our friends. Help us as believers especially be very aware of that person that just made me feel alone. We have this amazing thing to share in you. Help us to reach out and do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I'd like to thank you for coming out and worshiping with us today. And uh, we have our Bible study tonight at 6.30. I invite you to come out. We're just kind of getting back to some of the basics of our faith and, and what we believe. Uh, we're talking about the Holy Spirit tonight. Um, so I invite you to come out. It's very casual, uh, informal. <clears throat> Just come out and be a part of that. We'd love to have you. Um, we're going to be dismissed with a song. Um, guys? You sweet to trust in Jesus and to take him at his word just to rest upon his promise and to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I proved him more and more Jesus Jesus Precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust His cleansing blood. 
and in simple faith to plunge me beneath the healing, cleansing love. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him more. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease. Just from Jesus, simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I proved Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust you. Jesus, Jesus. How I trust you I'm so glad I learned to trust Precious Jesus, Savior, friend And I know that thou art with me Will be with me to the end Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him How I prove more time. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Have a good week, guys. Go tell somebody about Jesus. <laughs>